And we're back. All right. It's like a radio show. How fun is that? All right, we are really going to shift gears now. And we're going to talk about understanding. This is be number three, I hope. I don't know. Understanding. <coughs> understanding something. I think it's number two. Want it to be two? Okay. Two. <laughs> understanding the... I tell you, I, I condense and change stuff <coughs> around, so... Understanding the certificating procedure for aircraft mechanics. For aircraft mechanics. Because I want you to know what you're in for and why you're here. And you're here for a good reason. But almost all of you can tell me now, if I want to find out where can I go to get information about the rules and laws for becoming a certi certified aircraft mechanic, where would I go? FAR. And the FARs. FARs are also called? 14 C. Covered in Title 14 <laughs> of the Code of Federal Regulations, Part 65. Look at you guys. And you know, the reason why I want, and I started this off with, first thing you're doing is, is um, the dirty dozen, because we talked about that. We've got to get our attitudes straight. We, we want to set the kind of mechanic we are from day one. Now, from here on out, I, we all have, we're on the same page. And then the very next thing I want you to do is look in the FARs. And the reason why is because I've known too many mechanics who are afraid of the FARs. And the FARs are my friend. Um, when you understand the federal laws, what you can and can't do, it just sets up boundaries and opens up highways, I think. And you don't have to depend on other people. I have an inspection authorization, and I got that almost three days, um, three, three years to the day of having my AMP because I knew the FARs, I knew when I could get it, wasn't afraid, I wasn't afraid of the FARs, and it's about being an IA. Um, so you shouldn't be either because they're, they're easy. Part 65 is not very thick, is it? So, no. And um, part 43, you need part 43 as a mechanic. You should be very familiar with part 43. It, it explains so much what you can do, tells you how to do stuff. You're doing a log entry, you gotta write stuff in a log. Well, what am I supposed to write in my log book? Well, where am I gonna go to figure it out? <coughs> FAR 43, dot? Nine. Nine or dot 11, depending on what I'm doing. So. Yeah, once you're familiar with it, it's just really easy. So it's under part 65, um, and that's, um, let me see, what do we need to be? What are, what are the requirements to be, let me see, requirements. What are the requirements to be a certificated mechanic? At least 18 years old. Okay, must be 18 years old, yeah. at least. Old, okay, two. Read, write, you don't have to write well, thankfully. Write, speak, and understand English. Except, there is an exception to this. If you do not read, write, speak, or understand English language, that is okay. Your certificate will simply be labeled on the on, on it, valid, valid, only outside the U.S., valid, only outside the U.S., U.S., actually says United States, I'm going to abbreviate. So if you don't, it just says that. And there are a lot of people from foreign nations who have a A&P certificates from the federal, from the FAA, who just simply work on our aircraft outside the U.S. with <coughs> there? Okay. What else? All right. So great. Everybody in here is over eighteen. Everybody in here can read, write, and speak and understand English. So how come you don't have a card in your pocket? You have the same as that. Part of it 
Okay, so um, let's see, we have an air carrier with with uh, United States registered aircraft, and they're going to I don't know any country, what Japan? Okay, flying to Japan, and we have a maintenance base in Japan. Or United, let's say United has a maintenance base in Japan, and so the entire maintenance base is staffed by <coughs> by Japanese, but working on our airplanes. And the op specs for United Airlines says if you're going to work on air aircraft, you must have an A and P. So it doesn't make sense. It just makes perfect sense. You're in that country, you can speak your language. We'll give you books in your language. You can understand it better. You know, and so it just says valid outside the U.S. only. Um, okay, so uh, again, so if everybody in here meets one and two, how come you don't have a certificate in your pocket? Okay, pass test. Mm -hmm. Must have passed. Passed. All tests within 24 months. So that means you can't take you can't take the next 10 years to do this. Once you start, you have 24 months. Uh, what tests are those? It'd be the oral, and oral okay, we have written's. How many? Three. 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 We have the general. Airframe, oops, I'm just going to abbreviate it. Airframe and power plant. What if you only want a power plant license? Then which test would you take? Ah, general and power plant. What if you only want an airframe? General and airframe. All right, so believe it or not, everybody who's starting next semester just because of the way our program is all set up, you're going to do three semesters, and you're eligible for your power plant. So if you're smart and you want to be up on things, what you're going to do is you're going to do one, two, three semesters, and during that break, where would that put a summer break? Mm -hmm. Okay, you are going to go take your general and your power plant, and you're going to come back to school, and you're going to have a power plant certificate in your pocket. How long is that summer break? Is that for eight years? No, summer break is three months. Oh, really? It's yeah. just a regular summer break. Summer break. Like. And then you'll do one semester, and you'll go get your airframe. Yeah. So, um, will we have everything we need for the general <coughs> first yeah. semester as well? Right, because you have to take your general and your power plant. Right. So then um, if it's one semester, we'll be ready for a power plant. One semester, we'll be ready for our airframe. No, it's... No. Okay, if you start not this next semester, but you wait until the Aero 300, you got to do the whole two years before you qualify for anything. Okay. It's just a weird nonsense. Don't try and figure it out. It just is what it is. So, all right. Okay, so you got to do your three writtens, and then what? Oral and practical. All right. So now if you're going to do general airframe power plant all at once, what you do is you take the general test and the airframe the power plant. You can take them all the same day. You can take... Three days to do them all, I would recommend uh, one, two, three days, one each day. Knock them out. Don't wait. You're never going to be more prepared than the day you graduate. Do that. Then you go see a, an examiner. They're going to do oil and practical on all, th all three at one shot. You're done. Yeah. Uh, if you go to get the airframe <coughs> and do the general, do you have to retake the general when you go for your power plant? Nope. It's just an add-on. Okay. Otherwise, I'd say don't do that. But no, you only, you're only you going to do general, airframe, power plant. And so you do general, power plant. Then you do last semester, then you just do airframe. Now, you do have to go back to the exam. You have to take your oral practical in just the airframe, but that's not a problem. I Okay, so speaking of this oral and practical, I told you guys that I used to do this. I was a mechanic examiner, and I was not, I only taught here very limited back then as just kind of a part-time adjunct substitute here and there. I taught a fabric class. That was, you know, my big thing. Um, but it got to the point where um, I wasn't charging a lot back then, but I actually just, I discounted anybody who went to this school 100 bucks, simply because my day was $100 easier, and it was almost a guaranteed pass. Everybody who showed up, just boom, boom, boom. And it was, I was like, I'm just start giving a discount. This is easy. I want to do everybody from City College. And I, most of the students that I talked to, we talked to all of our students, you know, they go do their oral practical. I'm like, how was it? How'd your examiner do? Most of the comments are, I had a good time. I had a lot of fun. And you should. 
Um, and the reason why they have a lot of fun, and, and, I, and I tell them, you know, I'm telling you, you should have fun when you go do your oral practical because you are going to be extremely well prepared. I know that you know everything if you graduate this program, and it's a chance for you to showcase your skills and how great you, you did. Kelly, do you remember your oral practical? Yes, and that is what he told me. Did I tell you that? Yeah, but I was still nervous. <laughs> that it was, every, they say, it's going to be easier than you think, and it is, but how do you know what, and I think it's only that way because you, I prepared. Yeah. Yeah. You're prepared. So. All right. Um, what are the ratings? Ratings. Our ratings are airframe. There's three of them, actually. One, two, three. What are the three ratings? Yep, airframe, power plant, and airframe and power plant. What if, let's see, well, we'll just do this way. How to get, how to get uh, your AMP. Your A and P. Well, first of all, you can do it just through experience. So what kind of experience would you need to not have to go to school? Am I scrolling too fast? 18 months. 18 months. So 18 months for A or P and 30 months for A and P. <coughs> All right, so you have to go to school almost two years to get the summer off. So why not just go out and work for somebody? What is the, what is the benefits? What's the benefits of school? You get a great scope of knowledge, much broader. So firsthand, as a mechanic examiner, I always cringed when I would get that phone call. Yeah, I want to take my test. Okay, tell me. And I would I had to have to interview them. And okay, tell me a little bit about yourself and, you know, what, what I can expect. Well, the worst, and I'm sorry, guys, the worst was always, I'm a crew chief on a helicopter. <laughs> You're a crew chief on a helicopter, huh? Yeah. The worst. I knew I was going to have a bad day. Um, why? Because helicopter people know helicopters really, really well. And most of the time, they're looking at a small, you come to an examiner, and we all have little Cessnas. And they look at it and go, never been this close to a little Cessna before. And little Cessnas have magnetos. And helicopters do not. And little Cessnas have ailerons. And helicopters do not. And it's just all these things. And so as much as I would try and gear a test towards helicopters, eh, most of the world is not set up for it. And crew chiefs are usually the worst because bad crew chiefs that always, every question you'd ask them would be, okay, so you give them a scenario, okay, the engine does this, what do you do? I'm going to call the engine shop. Okay, you, next time you tell me what shop you're going to call, this. <laughs> yeah. Yes, no, there's no calling shops. Anyway, so um, you, get, you get a great spectrum of knowledge that covers about everything. So people with experience are usually very limited in their experience. So, you know, you go out to work in the field, you work in general aviation, you, they know piston engines in forward and backwards, and then you're going to get a question about uh, pressurization on, on large aircraft or uh, fire control systems or turbine engines, and you're just kind of lost. Going, Whoa, I don't know about that. But you go to school and you know about it. So school, so we uh, attend a part. What part is it? 147. See, look at all the stuff you guys are starting. A few days ago, I said part 147. Everybody's like, I don't know what he's talking about. Now you guys are telling me part 147. Is that cool or what? Yeah. Okay. Uh-oh. I covered more than I should have. Now my, my notes are all set up. Uh, let's see. We got testing. Let me see. We'll just put a little dot there because I don't know where I'm at anymore. Uh, okay, we got the three written tests, uh, oral practical. The certificate lasts. The certificate lasts. How long is your certificate good for? Life. Right? Lasts for life. You want to know something? Just, just 
I can't get over. How much does it cost to apply for an A and P certificate? Hundred bucks. Nothing. Oh, Absolutely nothing. It is completely and totally free. I can't. I think if you lose your card, you may have to pay five bucks or so. I don't know. Oh wow. It's and how much is it per year? Nothing. Okay, I have a California real estate broker's license. You know how much it costs me to maintain that every year? Like about seven hundred dollars. <laughs> Yeah, so and I and I also have I have other licenses and you know, mortgage broker license and stuff, and that's like another five hundred and fifty a buck every single year, all right. So what what does it cost to keep your life? Nothing. I haven't paid a dime to the FAA in my life. So you, you shouldn't be saying this out loud. They're gonna figure it out. <coughs> mm. Is the uh, oral and practical when you have the examinations? A crap load of money. <laughs> I wasn't even, I didn't even know numbers went that high. Now, it's, uh, oh, $150 per each written, and <coughs> roughly $750 to $800 yeah. for your oral practical. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you're a vet, it's paid for. So start saving up. Um, yeah, your GI Bill pays for it. Also, there's, there's scholarships and stuff that'll come out. Keep your ears open. Uh, last for life. All right, so... Um, but, what's the but on that one? Uh, you have to be... Um, but is not active. Is not active or valid. Or valid. Six unless... Unless what? Unless... Uh, uh, six months? First of all, approval by the administrator. The an administrator... What the heck is that? It's in there. And I love this one. I have the same thing with my inspection authorization, my IA license. Um, I have to renew it every other year in March, and there's some requirements and stuff that. And there also says that, or approval by the administrator. What that says, basically, is that if you're not active, and, and we know that you should know that uh, you have to have six months experience in the last 24 months. So <coughs> let's just say you hit by a bus and went into a coma for, you know, seven months. Came out of it, but I'm ready to go back to work. But is my license valid anymore? No. Nope. So now I don't have a valid license. So really what that means is I have to go back to work under somebody and they're going to watch over my work for the next six months until I've got my six months back and, and I, you know, everything's good. Or I can just walk in the FA office. Well, you can't walk in the office. You got to call, make an appointment. I can walk, make an appointment, and walk in the FA office and say, "Hey, I've been in a coma for some months, but I I'm good to go, and I feel strong, and my brain's working. And I want to get back to work, and I want my license, and I don't want to work anybody else." And they could say, "Yeah, you're good." So, and it's the same thing with the IA. Um, to renew it, you either have to go to eight hours of training every year, or you have to, which is, which I like. Or if you've just done a certain number of annuals or a certain number of um, 337s, major alteration repair forms, they just consider, hey, you're good. You're just so busy, you're good. It's, I don't get that. Or I could just walk in the FA office and say, I don't want to do any of that. I just want you to say that I'm okay. And they could do that, but they're going to look at you and go, why? Why could you not do the recurring education? Nobody takes that one for some reason. Uh, approved by the administrator. Where am I at? Um, you have you have six months experience out. Oops, out. Out of the last twenty-four. Well, how's that going to work out for you guys? You're going to graduate one day. You're going to get your, take your test the next three days, your oral and practical on the fourth day, right? Because you're not going to be afraid. Then you're going to get your brand new license. Is it, is it valid and active? you got to go work for six months. It's good. It's good to go. Because we're working on you, right? Ah, it's just it's the way the rules are. It's good. <laughs> it's good to go. <laughs> and you'll be out and working in no time. Uh, what is experience? Actual work. Six 
supervisory. Well, I like this one. Or executive. So that guy's sitting upstairs in his mahogany office. That counts for him, too. All right, general privileges under 65.81. What can you do and not do? This can get rather confusing, so I'm not going to go into great detail. I want to keep it not confusing, but I am at the end of my paper, so I have to scroll over some. So I'll let you write that. Okay, the FAA defines different type of work under 43 Appendix A. So 65 is certification, uh, 43 is maintenance. So under 43 Appendix A, we have different type of work. Can I move this over? No, you're still writing back there. Okay, so different kind of work. We have preventative maintenance, repairs, alterations, major repairs, major alterations, and inspections. So those are all different things. So, um, well, I should have some nice examples with me, but preventative maintenance. Uh, preventative maintenance is something that a non-ANP can do on their own airplane. So if I didn't have an A&P, there are certain things that I'm allowed to do on my own airplane as an owner. I can change the oil, I can change the tires. Um, I, don't, I don't remember the list real well because I have an A&P, so I don't care what that list is. Uh, but... Hannah has an airplane too, and she asks, but she's too busy to work on her, so she calls me up and says, I know you're a pilot and not an A&P. Could you just go work on my airplane too? Can I do that? No, no it's got to be uh, my own airplane, so my name's got to be on it. So, so preventative maintenance. Then there's repairs. Well, repairs when something breaks. So an aircraft uh, lands with the gear up, skids in. Is it going to need a repair? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's going to need a repair. So... Um, we're going to have to take the engines off, the props off, and rebuild the engines, rebuild the props. You're going to have to repair that belly skin. It's repair. Okay? Alteration is when you change something about the aircraft. And this is the, really one of the things I love about airplanes is that when you work on cars, people can do anything they want to a car. Right? I mean, you can take a Miata and make it into a pickup truck if you're crazy enough, right? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's crazy, right? Okay, but you're never going to see something like that happen with an aircraft. It has to be the way it is. So what happens is when somebody builds an aircraft, we'll say Cessna because it's easy for me. So Cessna builds an aircraft, and what they, you get with this aircraft is something called a type certificate data sheet. TCDS, Type Certificate Data Sheet. Can I, you good? Okay. You guys don't have to worry too much. You know that I, I may talk a lot, but I'm always going to back up and write stuff for you. Have you seen that video where uh, someone put a Hellcat engine in, in an aircraft? In an aircraft? Yeah. Well, you can do that. Home builds is a whole different story. So I'm talking about, like, okay. If you have a home built, you are the builder and the manufacturer. You can do whatever you want. So, so. All right, where did I leave off? Uh, different type of work. Did I write that? No, different. General privileges. Yep, different type of work. This is defined by the FAA under 43 general Appendix A. What's that? This is under general privileges. Um, no, I skipped over to 43A. I'm talking about your general privileges, but now I want to say, hey, by the way, there's different type of work as defined under 43 Appendix A. So we have preventative maintenance. And who can do that? A pilot. Pilot on oops, on own <coughs> aircraft. Let's make some notes. Then we have um, repair. We have, and I talked about repairs, which the word makes sense. Can I talk about alterations? Okay, so there's, if you change, okay, where was I? So T, C, D, S. So an aircraft is made and has a type certificate data sheet. T type certificate data sheet. 
And depending on when the aircraft is made, um, I don't want to get too tech. We'll keep it simple. It has, type certificate data sheet has all kinds of stuff. Like if I pull up the type certificate data sheet for my little Cessna, it's going to have things like, well, it has two seats and they're located this many inches back from the firewall. It has two fuel tanks and they're located in this spot. It has two main landing gear and one, one nose wheel. And the landing gear tires are this size and, and the nose wheel is this size. And it has elevators and the elevators must go up this many degrees and down that many degrees. And it has ailerons and they must go up this many degrees and down that many degrees. It's going to describe all of that stuff. It's going to go, oh, it's got a Continental O200 engine and it must have this prop, this prop, or this prop. And it kind of goes down a list like that. And it says, you know, oh, C note something. Well, this note says, that, oh, it should have all of these placards on the instrument panel. And this other note says, oh, it can also be certified with a child seat in the back, which they're little tiny baby seats. And it has all these little funny things. And and it kind of goes on from there. And if I want to change any of that, it's an alteration. Now, when I say change stuff, I mean, you might think, okay, so what would be an alteration to an aircraft? You guys give me an example. What's that? Swapping what? What part? Okay, a wing. I want to take the wings from my Cessna 150 off, and I want to put wings from a Bonanza on there, because I know Bonanzas are really fast. So I want to go fast, but Bonanza wings. That would definitely be an alteration to end all alterations. All right, and I, and I will not argue with that being an alteration. Okay, there's an alteration. What else could be an alteration? So a different engine. I don't want my O200 anymore because it's only 100 horsepower. I want the engine out of a, um, a Cessna 172, which is 150 horse on the front of my engine. Now it's much heavier and I need a different prop. That is a major, that is a definitely an alteration. And that's described as a major alteration. We have minor and major alterations, by the way. Um, would be like if you change out your instrument valve. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, that one's a hard one. There's, <laughs> That'd be major. Um, you're required to have certain instruments, but you yeah. can actually change the panel. And like it's, the layout. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what I'm doing. Okay, how about this? You guys have cars? You ever, you know what a Canaan air filter is? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Can you change out the paper air filter in your car and put in a Canaan? in Okay, um, I can't. That is a major alteration for my aircraft. My aircraft came with a Cessna paper air filter element. If, and they make a, this is the number one modification, by the way, to airplanes. They make a K&N style uh, filter, a little foam filter with oil on it. I hate touching them. That you can swap out. And that foam, little foam filter goes in there. It's the cheapest thing you ever find in aviation, like $9. And um, I want to put that on there. I literally... That is actually a major alteration. I have to fill out a Form 337, a major alteration repair form. I have to get somebody with an inspection authorization to inspect and certify that it was done in accordance with the paperwork that goes with it. It is literally two screws. Hmm. That's the same thing with the car, though. If you change out, yeah, like say, for instance, in my Challenger, if you change out uh, by adding in the k filter, it voids everything. You have to have it specifically done by the dealership. Yeah, that's warranty. Yeah. Okay. And for us, it's not really a warranty or manual. It's Ill, it's an illegal <laughs> aircraft. So if I don't, oh. if I, it's, an, it's, it no longer meets its type certificate. Just by changing that out. Yep. It changes the certificate. Yep. And I will talk about what that means. So, oh. so that, so anyway, that's, you have alterations. Then we have, um, okay, so. We can do simple repairs, and we can look in uh, 4313. What is a simple? What's a simple repair? Oh, you know, a little little paint scrape here, a little paint on it, or you know, something like that. Um, you can do minor alterations. I'm talking about major, is what I was talking about. So we have major repairs. Major repairs are usually something that requires riveting or more complex skills to to fix. Um, then we have major alterations. That is something, a major alteration is something that does not comply with the type certificate. A minor alteration would be um, my plane. I told you it's only certified with one engine, but I had three different propellers I could choose from. So I take off one propeller and I buy the other and put it on. Is that a repair? Yeah. Is it an inspection? Therefore, it's an alteration. <laughs> But is it a major alteration or a minor alteration? If it's on the list of the type certificate data sheet, well, it's just a minor alteration. So it's easy to do. So that's the difference between 
a major alteration in a minor. It's, this is getting a little deeper than you guys need to go. I just want you to know there's, there's different types of work, right? And so I want you to hear it a couple of times over and over. And then there's our inspections, which are neither preventative and maintenance. It's not repairs. It's not major alterations. It's just, it's an inspection. And yes, but it's a different type of work. It is classified by the FAA as a different type of work. And the kind of inspections we could look at, we could do like a 50 hour or a 100 hour or um, an annual um, progressive inspections, uh, phase checks. I mean, it goes on and on from there. All right, so you want to be an A&P. As an A&P, you may perform or supervise, which is nice. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to get your fingers dirty. You can perform or supervise maintenance. Which includes uh, preventative maintenance, any kind of maintenance. You can do um, preventative maintenance then. So if we have our A&P license and eventually we move somewhere, can people train under us and get their A&P license? Yep. <coughs> You can do alterations. Um, you can do repairs. I didn't put that on there. You can do repairs. Um, I don't want to confuse you too much. So I'm just going to put like a little line right here. OK, so all of this you can do, and you can sign it off if you're an AMP. You can do maintenance, preventive maintenance, alteration, repairs. You can do it. You can sign it off. You're good to go. Um, for major repairs, major, or a major alteration, you can do it, but you can't sign it off. So, can do, can do, but not sign off. Who can sign it off? Somebody with an inspection authorization, assuming you have appropriate data. So if you did a major alteration to an airplane, so we've got Tobias down there who put his, his new wings on, <coughs> Bonanza wings on a Cessna, and he calls me up and says, hey, Kevin, I remember that you're an IA. I just, I just did this. Uh, can you come inspect and sign it off? And what am I going to say? He says, oh, i got to see this. And so, <laughs> and so I'm a, I want to show up and at least look at it. And then I'm going to say, where's your approved data? What word did I use? Approved. approved data. Not data, because, you know, he's a smart guy. He's like, where's my data? I drew it at home on my computer, and uh, you know, I, this is my color crayon rendition, and, you know, and, and, and I'll probably know Tobias. I'll say, I don't know what any of this says, but um, so his handwriting's terrible. And so I'm going to look at it and say, well, you don't have approved data. I, I can't sign this off. Now, if he's got approved data, uh, first of all, I'm going to be shocked. And, and then I'm going to read all the approved data, and I'm going to inspect his work and make sure it matches all of the approved data. And if it does, he did everything right, then I can, I, I can sign it off. I actually can. verify that data, though. Yeah, but that's easy to do. It's actually easier than you think. Can you uh, scroll, scroll up a little bit? Scroll up like that? Or <laughs> you like the white spaces? How far? See, because I don't have a lot of room to the right up here. The little video is right here right now. Because you can't see me. I can't right there. All right, so you can do it, but you can't sign it off. That can be kind of a kind of a, uh, a confusing thing. It's like, wait, I can do it, but you can't sign it off. But, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah? How does data get approved? How does data? Oh. Uh, well, first of all, like, like the, uh, the, the air filter I'm talking about, okay, so the company who made that air filter, they apply for what's called a supplement to the type certificate, an STC. So they do all the engineering work and they go through all the testing and proving to the FAA and the FAA stamps it approved with an STC. And I buy that filter and it comes with a little piece of paper in it with oil on it already. And it says, this 
air filter is approved for use on, and it's got all the models. And so, and it says STC on the top and has a number, SA71GL, I think it is. I shouldn't know that. Um, <laughs> but I've uh, done enough of them. And so it, it says Cessna 150, and I'm okay. So I fill out uh, the proper forms and stamp it, and there it is. Okay, or um, Tobias goes to an, a, an FAA approved engineer, DAR, designated. Uh, DER. DER, thank you. And you go through all the engineering and get it all approved, and that would cost, uh, you're just better off buying a new plane, but uh, a couple of them. But anyway, you can do all that and get it approved. In the old days, it's still in the books. I haven't heard anybody this. In the old days, it's like the Wild West. It was freaking cool. You had this thing called a field approval, and you could just dream up something crazy, like putting bonanza wings on a Cessna. And if you could find a crazy enough and drunk enough FAA guy in the local office to come out, have a couple things of scotch, he would actually stamp it and go, yeah, it looks good to me, <laughs> and sign it up. Um, I shouldn't say it like that. It, it had to make sense. But I, I remember back in the crazy days, like I would get airplanes that were modified they shouldn't have been. I had one, um, had all these crazy mods, and it, it would have been unairworthy. They were not approved. There's no STC. I mean, it had seats from one style airplane. They changed the angle of incidence on the um, – on the horizontal stabilizer. They, they shortened the spin strips on the wings. I mean, there's all this stuff. And so I just did a um, it's Form 337 major alteration pair. I did one for each one of these things. I remember it started the fuselage and went the length of the wings. And I had little paperweights on them. I called the FA guy and he came out and he just did one at a time. He stamped every single one of them. So. Oh my gosh. <laughs> no, that doesn't happen anymore. I wasn't going to say it, but yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at Rich. I knew he knew that. But he was a great, he's also the guy who gave me the grief. I told you about having to bring my, my – that was him too. So he got me back. So don't <laughs> – uh, One other question. Can a DER approve their own data? I think so. Okay. I'm not one. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, back here. So I kind of have a similar question about the uh, – because you're an IA, right? Yes. So could you – no, I can do it all myself. Okay. And I do. I do my own annual inspections. I do my own major alteration repairs. So, yeah, it's not, it's not a problem at all. Okay. We good? Okay. So we can do that. Where am I here? Well, you may not. What can you not do? The forbidden. You may not perform. Can you perform a major alteration and repair? Yes. Yes, you can. You can do it. Who has to sign it off? IA. All right. But here's what you can't do. You can't do it. Period. Don't touch it. Major alteration. Major. Oops. I don't know where I'm doing. Major. Major something. Major alteration. or repair to propellers. You can't do it. You can't do it. I'm an IA. I can't do it. I can't sign it off. Not going to happen. So who can do a major alteration or repair to a propeller? Somebody's got to be able to do it. I need a crickets. Crickets, crickets. Only repair station. A repair station is a company that is basically like an A&P slash IA. Uh, but it's very different. Like I worked for my company wasn't a repair station, and then we did it, turned it into a repair station. And so a repair station can do anything that their op spec says they can and nothing they can't. Like my company before we were um, a repair station, we could work on any engine we wanted to. Once we became a repair station, we can only work on engines up to 450 horsepower. So why the limit? Well, because the FAA loves repair stations and they really want to, <laughs> sorry, they, they want to help you become one under most circumstances. Um, and the reason why is because they can kind of tightly control what you do. And so like the FAA would come in and they would look at our equipment and say, okay, you want to overhaul engines, what, what tooling do you have? Show them all the tooling. Okay, do you have tooling for um, the Pratt and Whitney um, 13, 1340, 
Uh, we really don't. Okay, do you have stuff for Pratt and Whitney? Uh, 985. Yes, we do. It's all right here. Well, 985 went up to 450 horsepower. I said, okay, we'll let you go up to that size engine. And so, you know, they can look at that. So you can't do anything other than that unless you go get the equipment and the tools and stuff. So, but uh, so, so it is with propellers because they're under such tremendous amount of stress. Uh, I don't have the, the, when we get in that class, I have it written down. It's the, the amount of pounds of pressure of the propeller trying to pull itself apart and leave is measured in the, in the tens of tons. So um, they don't want us touching repellers. They want only a certified repair station touching propellers. So you can, you can look at them and do some very minor things. That's about it. Um, any. Anybody have a problem with the word any? I can look it up for you. Any repair to instruments. What's an instrument? The compass, airspeed indicator, altitude indicator, um, gyros. gyros, any of that. Uh, yeah, right there. Thank you for that picture because I've seen it in my mind. So anything in that, <laughs> anything over here, no, you can't touch. You, can't. Um, but you know what's funny? Here's the compass. So if uh, compasses are filled with, uh, they're called whiskey compasses. It doesn't, not whiskey in there, but it looks just like it. Um, What's that? I have a broken compass. Okay, so you have a broken compass. So how do you fix a compass? They leak a little bit. They tend to leak. The gaskets go bad, and the little kerosene leaks out. So what do you do? Well, you go to Aircraft Spruce and Specialty Company, and they sell a gasket set, and they sell compass fluid. Everybody does it. In fact, I bet you anything, I could walk into our tool room and probably find the compass fluid and a gasket set or two. A compass what? Fluid. fluid. Are you allowed to do it? But you can buy the parts. Everybody does it. That's a norm. You got it. That's a norm. You can't do it. You cannot do it. So would you be able to like get the parts and all the, the necessary little pieces you need and then take it to somebody who is authorized to do it? <laughs> They're gonna laugh at you. They're like, it's that's like uh, that's like going to the steakhouse, but it's like, hey, I stopped by Costco and brought some meat with me. Okay, well, I was hoping somebody would say, well, why can you buy it? Yeah, that's what I'm Because if I have a home built, I can do whatever I want. Uh, okay. So places like Aircraft Spruce are full of all kinds of stuff that is completely legal for you to buy, sell, do. Um, <coughs> If you own your own airplane, most of these rules are just thrown out the window. You can do whatever you want. Uh, you buy a home built, you don't have to have instruments uh, if you want to make your iPad. I've seen people get iPads and mount them and they have the instruments on the iPad. It's, do whatever you want. They don't care. There's no rules. You're the, you're the builder. If you're dumb enough to get in it, you just have fun. Yeah, that's why they're, they're labeled experimental on the side and stuff. So, yeah. So what happens if it crashes and it kills someone else? It's the way it works. <laughs> I know. That's why when you before you get into airplanes, it's experimental on the side. Say, whoa! Why? Is it, what, what are we experimenting with here? <laughs> the answer is everything. <laughs> everything. No, I don't mean to say anything bad about experimentals. If it wasn't for experimentals. I think uh, general aviation would have died. It would no longer be in existence. Um, I think they've helped to bring some of the costs down. They have done a lot of the research and development and implementation of a lot of really cool things because um, it is so expensive to get something certified for a, a regular aircraft. So, um, so what they've done is they've created the market. They're selling parts like crazy. Companies are making a lot of money and they're saying, we have enough money that maybe we now we can get it certified for Kevin and his little 150. So anyway, I've almost kept you guys too long.